Alright, hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, and I just wanted to uh, post up a couple of Shroud shows this week. Uh, so this is going to be uh, really relating to parts 6, 7, and 8 of my series. Um, but what I did is I edited out some of the feedback from part 6, and I combine, I'm going to be combining part 6 and part 7 uh, into one episode, just for uh, efficiency's sake, uh, for the videos. So, alright, uh, yeah, I hope you guys uh, enjoy the shows. Alright, hello guys, and welcome back to Dale's, uh, our study on the Shroud. Uh, this is going to be part six, and what we're going to be doing Last, last time, where we left off last time, uh, we completed Criterion A in my uh, for my various criteria for identifying a G belief authenticating event uh, or a, you know a miracle or a sign from God. Uh, and I, our main argument is that the Shroud of Turin has various image features, and the event of their formation of these image features constitutes this what we call are calling a G belief authenticating event. So. What we're going to do in this time, now that we've completed Criterion A, for Part 6, I wanted to move on a little bit to Criterion B. And this is the criterion, um, if you go to the document that I provided you uh, in Part 4, I believe, the attached document with my 11 premise argument. And in Premise 8, uh, that's the table where I have these criteria that we're using to judge the shroud. So now we're on Criterion B. So this is saying that the images and their formation are extraordinary. So in this podcast, we're going to be talking a little bit, giving sort of an introduction to, to what Criterion B is all about, uh, sort of detailing our method for applying Criterion B to the evidence from the Shroud. But then before we move on to our first image-forming hypothesis, uh, I'm going to save that. That's going to be the painting hypothesis by Walter McCrony. And I'm going to save that uh, next time for part seven. But what we're going to do is we're going to, after I do the introduction and explain a little bit about our method for Criterion B, we're going to take a time out. And David asked me to read through some of your guys' feedback because I've been getting a lot of feedback on the Shroud from various people. So I've, I've taken some of your comments and I'll read them out and, and, you know, sort of give a quick little response of what I think of what you guys had to say. So, so yeah, let's, first of all, let's get this Criterion B introduction, as well as, um, you know, methodology part completed. Okay, so you'll remember uh, from our, from what I mentioned in uh, part four, I think it was, uh, when I say, what does it mean for an event to be extraordinary? What, you know, or another word, you could use the same, you know, paranormal. Well, basically, Criterion B is trying to say that this sh a reasonable person, again, the legal definition, an average person doing their you know, average knowledge and intelligence, doing their average due diligence to, to research about the, the shroud evidence, could, not necessarily would, but they could conclude that uh, this event can't be explained in terms of ordinary or, or currently well-known or established natural mechanisms uh, and laws operating solely on their own merits. That can include natural events. It doesn't have to be supernatural. Extraordinary events would include both. But it's just where we have an indication that it's not solely the natural mechanisms, the well-known or well-established natural mechanisms operating on their own initiative. So, as I said, uh, that that uh, the way we do this, this is sort of laid out in, in premise eight uh, in that table under criterion B. And what what is uh, there are a couple of sub criterion of how we can identify an event uh, and and say that this type of event is extraordinary. And the first of these is what I call the uniqueness falsification criterion. So this is a, a falsification criterion. It's judged strictly on a pass or fail basis uh, on a balance of probabilities. So if it's more probably more probable than not that this event is unique to extraordinary or paranormal contexts, then it passes this criterion. If it's not, then it fails, and we can't say that the event is extraordinary. 
So, you know, what, what do I mean by extraordinary context? Well, again, it goes hand in hand with what we mean by extraordinary. You know, uh, it's it's things that indicate, it's context that indicate more, that go above and beyond the well-established laws of nature and, and natural mechanisms operating on their own initiative. So this would include things like supernatural religious miracles. It could also include things like ghosts or aliens. You know, Bigfoot would would technically be uh, extraordinary, at least at this point in time. Who knows if, if aliens are discovered one day or, or something like that. It, they, th- those may be incorporated at that time as well-established, but as of right now, they're not a part of currently well-known or established science or natural mechanism. By the way, even natural anomalies would qualify as being extraordinary as well and, and you know, could possibly be said to be an extraordinary event. So, okay, so how do we relate this to the shroud images? Well, basically, I'm, I'm going to be arguing that the shroud images and their formation, the formation of these, you know, minimal relevant features, as we outlined in Criterion A, can be reasonably demonstrated to be unique in terms of their occurrence solely within an extraordinary or paranormal context. So in the first place, uh, it has to be said Everyone admits this, even shroud skeptics admit that the shroud's images are entirely unique. There are no other natural or artistic um, or, or even artificially reproduced images, either in the lab or, or in the field. You know, there's been various experiments. None of those images that are known about compare to the shroud's complete or full list of physical and chemical property. So, you know, it, it, in fact, it's, it's not even the case that these images are, are just unique to extraordinary context, but even within extraordinary context, the, these images are entirely unique, period. There's no other religious relic that has images like this. You know, if you look at a ghost painting or, so, you know, that's an extraordinary context, but it, still, these images don't, com- there's no other compar- comparable images to the shroud in any context. So this is passed with flying colors, there's no doubt. Even the shroud skeptics admit this much. Um, You know, they they have certain justifications as to why the shroud images are unique. So that, you know, don't think that they're going too far, but that that gets into, they, they basically deny that there is a sufficient opportunity for other images, like their their experiments, to be exact duplicates of the shroud but that that's not part of this criterion we don't worry about the sufficient opportunity part yet we ju- we're just saying as a falsification criterion the shroud images are entirely unique and as a religious artifact it automatically qualifies as taking place within an extraordinary or paranormal context uh, you know, it's a context that implies the involvement of God automatically. I mean, if it's a religious, if it's a miracle and it has a religious context, uh, it, you know, so it, it's 100 percent. It passes this criterion, this falsification criterion. But yeah, as to the issue of sufficient opportunity, we'll, you know, we'll get to that in later podcasts. That's that's part of our next sub criterion under criterion B. And this is the most important part. This is the sub criterion for extraordinariness of, of an event that we're going to be spending the bulk of our shroud series assessing you know with with analyzing all the various image forming mechanisms this is where what we're trying to say with this second sub criterion is that well it's not enough for an event to be unique to extraordinary paranormal context it also has to be proven that a reasonable person could have a sufficient reason uh, to doubt that explanations involving solely ordinary um, so that, you know, natural mechanism. So by ordinary, that's what I mean, you know, currently well-established, well-known natural laws and mechanisms. Um, so a reasonable person should be able to doubt that ordinary natural mechanisms are equally possible explanations for the event. In other words, there has to be a sufficient reason for a reasonable person. There could be sufficient reason for a reasonable person to say that these all of these currently well-known and established natural mechanisms are improbable. There is a 49% probability or less that these events are are true. So, yeah, in that way, there can't be said to be equally possible explanations for forming the Shroud's images. And there's at least a couple different ways that we can establish this. So the first one is, is the direct one. This is, like I said, we're going to be spending a heck of a lot of time by evaluating the, the image-forming mechanisms. But... The first way is to show directly that, well, the 
various fe- MRFs or minimal relevant features of the shroud's images, based on that, we know that all we can show that all currently well known or established ordinary natural mechanisms could at least seem to a reasonable person to have been demonstrated either practically or theoretically to be improbable explanations. And then the, the second one, second way is based on other reasons that make the event seem to be extraordinary outside of directly assessing uh, the event itself. So th- this refers to various things such as the circumstantial evidence. Um, if you'll remember in one of the shows on Justin Brierley, Unbelievable, uh, I think it was Colin Humphreys, but yeah, he was trying to explain, well, you know, first of all, these... Um, uh, these miracles, the sun standing still, let's pretend that wasn't even supernatural. It was just a natural explanation. You know, it's an eclipse of the sun or something. Well, that, that's a mundane event. Or, no, no, but forget about the event itself. It's the circumstances, such as the timing of those events, unlikely things, one after the other, all natural phenomenon just happened to take place to allow Joshua, you know, within a, a religious, extraordinary context to fulfill his mission. It's in that case, you could argue based on the timing or another example in the movie Nativity Story. Um, you know, a couple planets and, and some other ast- astronomical object, they all happen to coincide and coalesce right at the moment over Bethlehem, right over, right at the moment of Jesus's birth. Well, there's nothing supernatural about this. This does happen naturally. I mean, it's a known phenomenon. Um, so you can't really use the, the event itself to prove, oh, well, God must have been involved in this occurrence of this event. But you could argue, well, yeah, but it's the circumstances, it's the timing, it's the fact that they all coalesced over Bethlehem, specifically at the time of Jesus' Jesus' birth. Uh, that means it's a sign. You could try to argue that way. Well, that's a sign, or that makes this event extraordinary, the timing or the circumstances. Now, I know that you guys, um, in the attachment I gave you guys in part four, if you guys are using that, you guys, I did because of, I was rushing, and I have various notes under my newer tables and stuff. You guys, I did send out a skeleton version that's a slightly older version. So, you know, for example, you'll see things that I, I've condensed it to two aspects. So, I've included the f- the first one in your table, which is uniqueness to extraordinary context despite the sufficient opportunity. I'm now subsuming that under the first way of concluding an event is extraordinary you know uh, basically that that's a practical way i'm saying that's a practical way of establishing all the currently well-known and established ordinary natural mechanisms are improbable or you know that someone could consume uh, say that conclude that they're improbable events but just before we get into that um let's assess let's first start with the easy one the the theoretical ones these are, are purely theoretical reasons and arguments that a person can have for thinking that a natural mecha- all the natural mechanisms are improbable. One of the most obvious ways that philosophers like Richard Swinburne or Gary Habermas mention is, is obviously, well, if you can prove that they contravene an established law or laws of nature, um, well, that's one way of, that's probably the most obvious way of providing theoretical reasons as to why this, as to why certain natural mechanisms are implausible or could not be true or are improbable to be true. Um, but there could be other reasons um, outside of violating a law that of nature, which could show that various natural mechanisms are improbable. So, yeah, just note that while this theoretical aspect could be fulfilled, remember that falsification criteria. Maybe someone has theoretical reasons for thinking uh, uh, natural mechanisms are improbable. Well, the skeptic could say, well, okay, well, our, our laws of nature, let, let's pretend I prove it contravenes a law of nature or something, you know, the strongest way to prove this. Well, maybe our laws of nature need updating or something like that. Um, You could try to argue that that way. Um, So this is where I think this added falsification criterion would come in. And God could indicate to us if there it looks like it contravenes a law of nature, an established law of nature, but it's not unique. It takes place within natural, con- naturalistic context. Okay, well, based on that, we can say, okay, right away, we know it's not an extraordinary event. We, that's an indicator that, okay, well, our, just, our understanding of the laws of nature need updating. There's, there's something there uh, that we need to look at. 
Um, so that's how the, the two, those two would sort of work together, and they have to both be fulfilled in order to work. You no, know, just just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, let you know some people in response to the resurrection, the appearance to the twelve, they'll argue well, collective hallucinations, simultaneous group hallucinations, um, especially where where everyone shares the same hallucination together, those are improbable or impossible from what we know based on the literature on hallucinations and the scientific evidence. You know, hallucinations are individual subjective experiences, just like dreams. Uh, one other people can't share in that dream, and they, they unless there's some sort of coordinating factor like drugs or hypnosis, they, they won't have it. They won't have individual ones simultaneously. So these are theoretical reasons that someone would say the appearance of the 12, if it happened, is improbable to happen given natural mechanisms like group or collective hallucinations. But let's say, well, we have this example outside of a, an extraordinary context. For example, we have a group of people that all simultaneously hallucinated seeing Tom Cruise. Oh, that then this type of event would fail the falsif uniqueness falsification criterion. And you could say, well, okay, our knowledge just must be wrong. It's, we can't conclude it's an extraordinary event. Uh, you know, hold off judgment. We need to learn some more. So that, that's how these two sub-criteria would play off each other. However, there's the second way to which I alluded to, and that's the practical way of showing, you know, all the natural mechanisms are improbable. And this automatic, if this is fulfilled, this automatically fulfills the falsification criterion. But it, it's basically saying that the event in question is unique to extraordinary or paranormal contexts, right? That, that was our falsification criterion. But this is despite the fact that it has had a sufficient opportunity to be duplicated within a naturalistic context. And that's the key. That's where the Shroud skeptics will come in and, and they'll say, well, sure, the Shroud is, is unique uh, right now um, and, and it's within an, in an extraordinary context. It, it's a religious relic. But that, that doesn't mean anything because it hasn't had a sufficient opportunity to be duplicated in a naturalistic context. And that's why we can't replicate everything fully. I mean, when, uh, when Joe Nickel does his Shroud experiments, yeah, but that's relatively new. The shroud is centuries old, so who knows? Maybe some of the differences are because there's been centuries of wear and tear. Uh, you know, obviously we'll we'll get into more details on that front. But yeah, that that's where they would deny. They would deny that there's been this sufficient opportunity. So that aspect needs to be established if we're making a practical argument for the shroud's unique based on the shroud's uniqueness as to disproving all the currently well-known or well-established natural mechanisms. Now, with sufficient opportunity, well, how, how would we demonstrate that? And there are actually a couple different ways for that as well. So the first sense is, is the obvious. This is just sort of nat what I call natural opportunity. So, you know, while there's been millions of artistic paintings and artistic sculptures or and, st and icons or and stuff like that, so this is... Uh, natural opportunity. Likewise, if you believe there's a dead body, it was produced by some sort of natural mechanism as opposed to artistic, uh, naturalistic, let's say, um, you know, a dead body was rotting in, in a burial shroud. Well, there have been millions of people buried th in the Middle East. There's, you know, Muslims are still buried in burial shrouds today. Well, there's been a heck of a lot of sufficient natural opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so that, that could be a way of making that argument. That actually doesn't work, as we'll find out, but uh, it just giving you a sense of how uh, someone could attempt to argue for sufficient opportunity based on natural opportunities for duplication within a naturalistic context. You know, let, let's say we have King Henry VIII has a picture uh, by, Ma by Master Holbein, and it has all these properties of the shroud. Or King Henry was buried in a burial shroud, and we found that burial shroud, and it has images on the shroud. That would be natural opportunity for duplication. However, there's also what I call artificial opportunity. So these would refer to the fact that various scientists ha have done dozens of experiments, scientific experiments, both in the lab and in the field, in the actual field as well, as we'll find out trying to duplicate the shroud images using various natural methods and mechanisms. All of these have failed. So one could try to make an argument, well, there's been sufficient opportunity based on these artificial opportunities, you know, ex ex various scientific experiments 
people have done to try to duplicate the shroud. Uh, so that's how that, that would work there. Okay, and uh, yep, I've already kind of explained that. And the second way is that circumstantial uh, circumstantial argument or, or any other reasons as to why someone could conclude the Shroud's image formation is extraordinary. And I, you know, I, I already sort of gave you the example of what I mean with the timing from the nativity story. As, as we'll see, there is a circumstantial argument. It's not about timing, but there's another circumstantial argument that I think is successful based on the shroud evidence. But we'll we'll get to that later on in our series, much much later. Um, but yeah, it, that'll that will be an argument coming up that I as one of the reasons I think the shroud evidence is probably an ex, an extraordinary event. Okay, so so let's just go back to our first our first th way um, where we're going to be spending the the bulk of our time. Can we show that the shroud's image formation, along with all their minimal relevant features, that all currently well-known and established ordinary naturalistic mechanisms are improbable. Um, how, how are we going to go about assessing whether the shroud's evidence can fulfill this way of proving extraordinariness? In the first place, what we're going to do is we're going to split up the various image forming mechanisms or hypothes hypotheses that have been proposed. Um, and there are really only three major categories uh, that even most shroud experts put it, break it up this way. So the first are the ordinary artistic theories. You know, some kind of there's some kind of human artistic technique or effort that's being added to the mix. You know, like a painting or uh, you know uh, powder rubbing techniques or or you know using a statue and creating a scorch or a bas relief technique the, these are the these are the first mechanisms that we're going to be evaluating starting with Walter McCrony's the painting hypothesis which is the oldest the oldest one there's also what uh, the ordinary naturalistic hypotheses so these are hypotheses that postulate the presence of a human corpse and just natural mechanisms, laws and, and mechanisms operating on their own in ways that are just consistent with the natural law. There's no outside interference by human, uh, God, by humans, God, or any other agent. There's no purposeful intent to create these images. It just sort of, you put a body in the shroud, it, it just sort of happens. So, you know, the, these are going to be things like the direct contact hypothesis or, or gas diffusion, vapograph, stuff like that. Um, and then the third category is the ones related to the ones that I think is true, extraordinary theories um, or even supernatural theories, but extraordinary. Let's, let, it doesn't have to be supernatural, but, you know, things like radiation from a body. Um, there's another one related to electrostatic with Giulio Fonte, um, the corona discharge hypothesis. Well, so, yeah, these are the three basic categories. And... I just want to make a note here that our argument that we're making, it doesn't require me to prove um, or even mention the extraordinary mechanisms at all. We, we could throw out this category. Remember, all I have to do is prove that all the ordinary natural mechanisms, so the, those artistic ones and the naturalistic theories, are improbable, and then I've succeeded and met this sub-criterion. I'm going to throw in some consideration of the extraordinary theories. I think you all know I, I sort of favor this neutron flux hypothesis that Mark Antonacci, he calls it the historically consistent hypothesis. And I think that's the best one. That's the one I lean towards. But let's pretend that's garbage. Uh, let's throw out all these extraordinary... I don't, I don't have to explain how some supernatural or extraordinary mechanism created the shroud images. I don't care. As long as I can rule out all the currently ordinary naturalistic ones... That's, that's good enough. That meets this criteria. That's all I need. Again, we're not debating the criteria. It doesn't matter whether the, my criteria are justified or not. For you know, That's outside the scope of our Shroud series. I'm just saying this is what my criteria is. This is what we're trying to prove. So yeah, just bear, just bear that in mind as we go. And you know, I, I will mention extraordinary theories just so you have an all-encompassing knowledge of some of you know what what are some of the things that Christian or pro shroud proponents have thrown out there, such as that neutron flux hypothesis. And just a, a quick thing, obviously, I, I am going to be selecting out some uh, some theories, or because you know, ordinary naturalistic theories that are just ridiculous. I'm I'm sorry, you're an idiot if you think that this is true. So this is something like. 
uh, some some people have suggested that the shroud images were created in the medieval ages using modern laser technology. You're dumb if you think that's true. I'm not going to waste my time discussing something so stupid. So it's only going to be historically feasible mechanisms that I'm going to be addressing here. Ones that you know have a, at least a, at face value a feasible chance of of being possible explanations that that could have been employed by a medieval or earlier artist. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so as I said, we're going to be starting with the ordinary artistic theories. Um, we're going to assess each theory, uh, remember criterion A, in the light of how they perform in producing images of uh, with all of the minimal relevant features. That's why we outlaid all those features, you know, Ken, and we're going to grade the, the how the hypothesis performs in relation to those minimal relevant features, or MRFs. So, you know, if it, if it can account for it, great, it'll get a green check mark. Um, and I'm going to be providing a source for you. It's going to be my Excel file. So I, I sort of did an Excel table listing out all of the hypotheses that I studied and out all the features. Um, and then I sort of gave them, you know, a green check mark if, it, if they could fulfill the feature. I would give them a yellow question mark if there's a questionable status, if, if it's sort of iffy, we're not sure, um, and then a red X if the hypothesis fails to, to recreate this feature or it wouldn't be able to, to recreate that shroud feature. And then there's the purple circle. It just means it's neutral. We assume in favor of the shroud skeptic, any ordinary natural hypothesis. Uh, that has a, a purple circle. It's basically the same as giving it a green check mark, but I, I differentiated that because it's it's something that was either I didn't want to waste time studying, it didn't matter, uh, or I need more information on. Or shroud researchers say, well, we need more information on on this before we can make a determination. So that's what the purple circle means in the chart. Um, there's also an orange thing with double question marks. Um, that just means because certain um, certain theories are, are umbrella categories of mechanisms. So there's you know like five different uh, versions of a particular theory. Like for for example, with the direct contact hypothesis, this is an umbrella category. But there have been at least four or five different adherents with various versions of this type of mechanism that we're going to be addressing. Um, you know, or, or with powdered pigments or powder rubbing or dusting artistic techniques, there's at least three that uh, we're going to be addressing under that one main category or umbrella category of mechanism. And just, you know, if, if we fail to mention a particular feature under a given theory, let, let's say under a certain theory, I, I just neglect to mention superficiality at all. What we'll do is we, we assume I'm doing this because we're going to assume that the, the hypothesis can account for that feature. If, if I don't mention it or neglect to mention it under a given theory, just assume the theory can account for it. Okay, so only features where it's questionable or a failure or status needs to be discussed. Now, you know, I, I might break that rule and just sort of mention ones where the theory can can pass the hypothesis if there's like an interesting note or or some reason, but it, that's not necessarily the case. So if, if you find, you know, we get to direct contact theories and I skip the image superficiality, we're, we're assuming that that hypothesis can account for that feature. You know, assume in favor of the shroud skeptic. Okay, and then our second step of criterion B under this, um, you know, proving all the mechanisms are improbable, will be to do an overall cumulative case considerations and conclusion. So how are we going to do that? So once we've assessed all of the hypotheses in light of the features, at the end of each hypothesis, hypothesis category, I'm going to do an overall conclusion where I use the inductive or inference to the best explanation criteria. You know, scholars like Mike Lacona have used these or William Lynn Craig um, with, you know, the historical evidence to the resurrection, for example, in order to in inductively assess uh, the probability of these various hypotheses. So, yeah, we're, we're going to be enlisting the same criteria that uh, Mike Lacona gets from historian C.B. McCulloch. Yeah, that, that's going to be things like plausibility. Remember, there can be theoretical or the uniqueness is a practical way of saying, showing that a certain hypothesis is Im impro implausible. If, you know, if there's been a sufficient opportunity for 
a natural mechanism to produce similar images and it yet it hasn't then you could say well based on that practical argument such theories are implausible so that uh, there's also explanatory scope explanatory power uh, the theories have to be less at the less ad hoc the better you know don't don't employ too many ad hoc components and finally, as a bonus criterion, the criterion of illumination. Yeah, so basically I'm going to provide a table. That, that'll be in an attachment as well. Um, providing my table of all the theories with their grading of either pass, neutral, or fail in relation to these overall inductive criteria for evaluating that image forming mechanism or hypothesis. Obviously a pass would mean that it's more probable than not that it fulfills this criterion. Neutral means it's 50-50. It could or might not or not able to make an assessment you know we're, we're just assuming it's an equal possibility and then a fail quite obviously means it's a fail it's 49 percent uh, or less probability that um, this hypothesis will fulfills this criterion it's important to note that uh, not all of these criteria are equally weighty or have the same significance in terms of proving a naturalistic mechanism is improbable. It's actually in, automatically, I think, the first three. If, if a criterion, if a hypothesis is in, can be shown or argued to be implausible, to lack explanatory scope, or to lack explanatory power in some way, that makes the hypothesis improbable automatically. However, it, it might be that a hypothesis is ad hoc or lacks illumination, but that still doesn't mean it's an improbable hypothesis. So it would depend on the specific arguments or reasons under those criterion alone as to whether we can determine if a hypothesis is at, uh, is improbable or not. Okay, so uh, just what are these criteria that we're going to be using? Let's just give a brief mention. Uh, these are these uh, are the definitions as given by Mike Lacona, who's copying McCulloch. So plausibility means that the hypothesis or the image forming mechanism must be implied by or at least consistent with to a greater degree and by a greater number and variety of other accepted truths. So in response to our background knowledge, you know, does it comply with our, our background knowledge, our theoretical as well as practical uh, knowledge of, you know, do, does can this mechanism create images like this? Uh, does our background knowledge support this? Explanatory scope is obviously a criterion that accounts for the, the quantity of image facts or the, the number of minimal relevant features that a hypothesis can account for. Obviously, any equally possible image forming mechanism that attempts to explain the shroud images has to account for all of the minimal relevant features. Any image forming mechanism that can't account for one or more of these minimal relevant features is considered improbable or a failure. Next we have the explanatory power criterion, my favorite. Uh, this is the criterion that it looks at the quality of the explanation or the hypothesis in terms of explaining the relevant facts. In this case, again, those minimal relevant features on the shroud images. So the hypothesis that explains the data with the least amount of effort, vagueness, or ambiguity has the greater explanatory power. So if any theory has a questionable status on a certain fe minimal relevant feature, that could be said, okay, well, that's a, an element of vagueness or ambiguity. And if there are enough of those, that might amount to saying, well, the, the hypothesis is improbable. Um, but obviously the, the best way is if it gets a red X. If it's a failure and can't explain it, it takes too much effort or forcefulness to get this image forming mechanism to explain a given feature, that shows it's improbable right away. Next is the less ad hoc criterion, or in Latin, certeris paribus. So this sort of includes you know, things like the scientific criterion of simplicity, or maximum parsimony. Um, you know, you'll, you'll know it under Occam's razor, and this is basically the simplest explanation is probably correct. Um, and any hypothesis that employs less ad hoc components or non-evidenced assumptions is superior to ones that have more non-evidenced assumptions. And with this criterion, it, it is, I, I don't think it's automatic if, if uh, a theory fails to fulfill this criterion or if it does employ non-evidenced assumption, that, that doesn't automatically make the theory improbable because 
Yeah, I mean, it, it is possible, you know, that our world is complicated sometimes. It's not always the case that the simplest explanation is true. Um, you know, history proves that events can be complicated and or some theories just have to employ non-evidenced assumptions in order to work. We, we just have a paucity of, of data requiring assumptions. So, yeah, I, I think it will depend on the nature and the amount of non-evidenced assumptions that could possibly allow us to rule out certain uh, explanations as being improbable based on this criterion's consideration alone. Uh, but it's not automatically the case that, it, that a hypothesis is improbable because it's ad hoc. Finally, there's illumination, and this is more of a bonus criterion. It, it basically says that illumination is filled when a given hypothesis provides additional insight on other true but secondary facts, but they're not, you know, secondary facts don't have to be directly relevant to the issue of image formation or the formation of these minimal relevant features directly. Um, so these, these are secondary facts that are established with a high degree of certainty or confidence and or provides a possible solution to other problems outside of the scope of one's hypothesis or that don't confuse areas of knowledge that are held with confidence in other areas. So yeah, th this is a bonus. I'm, I'm not going to, it doesn't really come in as a factor as a, too much. I think there's only like one or two theories that I actually bring it up. But yeah, j just as I said, recognize that these various criterion have various uh, significances, um, know what the criterion are and understand our process of for evaluating each theory. We, we first assess them in light of the criteria, then we apply these five inference criteria for our overall conclusion in saying that a hypothesis is improbable or not. Um, okay, uh, so I think you guys are, are going to be happy. that That's it for my methodology and, and introduction to criterion B. From now on, and we're going to get into our first hypothesis, which is Walter McCrone's painting hypothesis, and start to apply our method, our method of criterion B to actual hypotheses. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to uh, our study on the Shroud of Turin. This is going to be part seven of our study, and uh, this time we're going to be going straight into our evaluation of the very first original art, uh, sorry, ordinary artistic hypothesis as an image forming mechanism, explaining how the Shroud of Turin's images and blood stain, uh, blood stains were put onto the shroud. And this is the infamous painting hypothesis uh, using traditional painting techniques, you know, paintbrush uh, and that sort of thing. This was ad advanced by uh, several people, but uh, in terms of actually having actual scientific evidence, uh, that only comes with a STIRP uh, associate or STIRP member, the skeptic Dr. Walter McCrone. And he's everyone who says, oh, there's paint on the shroud, everyone every shroud skeptic of different theories that says there's paint on the shroud are using the results that Dr. Walter McCrone found through his studies uh, on the shroud and which we'll be addressing throughout the next two podcasts on, on the painting hypothesis and how that matches up in, in regards to our method of criterion B. You know, how does it relate to the various minimal relevant features and can it account for all of them and also assessing a cumulative case consideration for our conclusion you know how does it stack up with regards to those inference criteria is it improbable uh is it equally possible or a probable hypothesis now just so you know there's with this there's a heck of a lot of data involved in this theory stirp spent probably a you know hours and hours and hours coming up with various tests. Obviously, this, this theory has been known about for centuries, so they, they came up with every conceivable uh, way possible to test scientifically whether this theory is true or not, and as we'll find out, it was completely falsified. Nobody living today, no Shroud skeptic or anyone, uh, believes this theory is true, and we'll find out why. But as I was saying, there's so much data here, so I'm probably going to have to break this up into two parts. It's it's going to be well over two hours if if I, you know, maybe going on three hours if if I go over everything in one podcast, and I'm still not covering everything. There are some things I had to leave out, but I think I'm getting the essence and all the main arguments in. But just be aware, it's probably going to have to be a two-parter and or something. So I'm going to have to break it up. We'll see. It. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so 
Uh, I explained to you, you know, how we're going to be assessing the painting hypothesis. First, by assessing the theory in light of each of the minimal relevant features that, that you know, things like the negativity, the three-dimensional aspect, the superficiality, you know, all, all those features in criterion A. And then finally, we're going to do that overall cumulative case conclusion and see how it measures up in terms of the inference criteria like plausibility, explanatory power, less ad hoc, and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's get to it. So the painting hypothesis is, as I've said, the oldest image forming mechanism theory that's been around. It's been around for centuries since... You know, since the recorded history of the Shroud as well, since the 14th century, really. In 1389, uh, one of the first evidences, it's, it's historical in nature, that Shroud skeptics like to point to, and they think this is good evidence, but it's not. But they point to a memorandum written by Bishop Pierre d'Arcis in the year 1389. So this is about 40 years or so after the first undeniable recorded appearance of the Shroud in Leary, France in 1355. Uh, to 1356. And he wrote a memorandum to the Pope proclaiming that the shroud images were shown by his predecessor to be an artistic fake, a, a painting, uh, and the artist had confessed to his crime, so to speak, to his predecessor, and therefore he, uh, the Pope should ban the shroud. Now, in his me memorandum to the Pope here, uh, or rather it was really an anti-Pope, it was Pope Clement from Avignon, um, Basically, Darsus defames the Leary Church, which was the church that had possession of the Shroud at that time. Oh, it's a cunningly devised fake. It, it's created solely for avarice or, or for money. They just want to get money. And, you know, this artist confessed to his crimes back then, and, and he wanted him, the Pope, to completely stop this. Basically, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of pilgrims were being attracted to the to this relic. The, this was the height of Catholic relic season and you know this this bishop was looking around and saying you know geez i'm not getting any money this isn't fair because uh the way leary the church at leary france uh was set up it was a local uh collegiate so it was under its own jurisdiction it was outside of the control of the bishop uh of that general area so he didn't have control over the money or anything like that so actually in point of fact, it was the bishop that was jealous and needed money, so he lied and made up stuff to the Pope to try and get his point across. And we'll find out more about the actual historical circumstances in a little bit. Just wanted to let you know, so there, there, what, there was this controversy, and what was the result? So basically the Pope wrote back to Bishop Darsus, told him to shut his mouth or else he would be excommunicated. He was you know, just stop these lies, basically, about the Shroud is what he told him. Um, however, one thing that helps the Shroud skeptic is he, he told um, the Leary Church to only, they're, they're still allowed to exhibit and take money from the Shroud, but they have to call it a likeness or representation of Christ. They couldn't say this is actually the Shroud of Christ. This was the qualification. So shroud skeptics, you know, think they're so smart. They like to say, "Ah, oh, you see, it's a conspiracy. They they knew it was a fake, but they so they they're trying to limit what people can say. Uh, that this is historical evidence that supports us, just like the carbon fourteen dating. And you know, skeptics really just mindlessly accept this kind of this kind of evidence, thinking it's good. But you know, they they would never accept this kind of thing if. It was on the, the shoe was on the other foot, and I was presenting something like this. These claims are completely unsubstantiated. In the first place, Darsus is quoting his predecessor from an investigation that took place 40 years prior. He doesn't provide any actual quotes or evidence, documentary evidence, for his claims. This is just him making up BS. Oh, my predecessor said this. No proof, just lies. But skeptics will believe anything when it supports their case, I guess. So just understand about the memorandum controversy uh, for actual honest and open-minded people here. There are some points that I think that you skeptics should be aware of in regards to this. So uh, if the Darsus memorandum is to be used as evidence, and I, I would admit, yeah, that this can be some historical evidence to consider. I mean, that there is this memorandum that exists. But it should be assessed as all historical documents are. Think of think of this, skeptics. If I just quote the Gospels to you, they were made about 40 years later. I, I guess I've proven Jesus turned water into wine because it's in a document, right? I mean, come on, be consistent here. Yeah, so I would say that actual people... 
people with uh, PhDs in history, actual historians, would say you need to understand the historical details as well as all the associated historical documents that come attached. In the first place, there's actually some controversy as to the precise meaning of the Latin that Darcis used. What, what did he say that the specific artist had actually confessed to this, or was he saying just an artist, someone not associated with the Shroud, gave him confirmation, yeah, this, this looks like it's just a painting or something like that? Uh, Ian Wilson, Shroud historian Ian Wilson, really lays out the case for this and, and everything surrounding the memorandum in Chapter 8 of his book on the Shroud. Lastly, uh, as I was saying, the Bishop of Troyes, or, or this bishop, was completely biased, and he had an obvious financial motivation to lie and make up stuff um, in order to get money. You know, this is, it's ironic because this is what he accuses the Leary Church of, even though they were rolling in the dough, and this was angering him because he didn't have control over this, what's, what's called a collegiate church. It was independent and outside of the bishop's control. Now, okay, Dale, this, this just sounds like you're being unfair to the Shroud Skeptic or unfair to Bishop Darcis. You're just, you know, turning it around and casting ad hominem attacks on this guy. Okay, well, what do we know historically about the circumstances Circumstances. Well, during the Christmas season in 1389, uh, Darcis's cathedral completely collapsed. The roof fell in, and this was due to one of the a failure in one of the arches that was supporting the upper tier. Um, plus, a very expensive window fell out. He needed money desperately. These are extremely expensive repairs that he needed to do to repair the damage. Therefore, that's motivation, people. That's how courts convict people. You know, that's one of the major factors. Bishop Darcis had a motivation to lie. The Leary Church doesn't have any provable... Well, no, okay. They, they would have a motivation to want to continue getting money and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, Darcis does have a provable, demonstrable motive to lie uh, because he was jealous. So, yeah, I think you need to be balanced, and I don't think this evidence is conclusive by any stretch it could go, it could go one way or the other so I will uh, and I'll provide a couple sources about the memorandum controversy and and the you know historical circumstances sort of surrounding that issue uh, that's that's not really a part of what we're going to be we're supposed to be doing here in criterion B but I just wanted you guys to be aware that there is this historical data or evidence point that shroud skeptics like to point to and they think it proves something when it doesn't. Okay, so let's get into proper. Let, let's move away from the historical anger and, uh, angle and get back into the actual science uh, as well as, you know, the focus of our main argument. So, Stirp was able to conclusively prove and scientific and or scientifically falsify the painting hypothesis. You know, regardless of the historical controversy surrounding the Darcis memorandum, we know today scientifically undeniable that the skeptic is just plain wrong here with regard to the traditional painting hypothesis. It was not, it, 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 whatever else it is, it's not a traditional painting. It's not an artistic picture, you know, by an artist. But just before we get too ahead of ourselves, let, let's see exactly what this evidence was that led Sturt to this unquestionable conclusion. You know, there's, as I said, there's no Shroud experts alive today, skeptic or otherwise, uh, who believes that the Shroud is a traditional painting. The last person who, who ever adhered to that was uh, the late Dr. Walter Macrone, and he, he's, uh, he died, I think, back in 2002. So after him, that's it. You know, no, nobody today believes this nonsense that skeptics like to point to. So just a bit of background. Who was Walter Macrone? Well, he was a famous microscopist back in the 1970s, late 1970s into the 1980s. Uh, and he first gained notoriety in the 1970s for his main uh, claim and public declarations that two famous artifacts were in fact artistic fakes or forgery. The first of these was the Vinland map. So that's the you know an alleged map that Vikings created uh, showing the new the new world, you know their journey into Newfoundland and that sort of thing. Macrone analyzed it and said, oh, this is obviously fake. Um, so 
that skyrocketed him or boosted his reputation. And that's when Sturp invited him to take part in the, shra- the sh- study of the Shroud of Turin. Again, e- making him equally famous, he declared the Shroud of Turin was just a painting and an artistic fake, and he said it was conclusively proven. As I said, uh, many ignorant Shroud skeptics today will rely on his findings as quote-unquote proof that the Shroud is nothing more than that, just some artistic painting that some guy took and and used uh, a paintbrush and and drew this thing up. However, one interesting point about Macroni and and his credibility as a scientist, as some, in the first place, he he is a noted expert. Sturp invited him to take part uh, for a reason, and he did find valid scientific discoveries about the shroud, to which every shroud, everyone needs to take account of those those findings, those can't be dismissed. However, it's his conclusions. He, you know, he's he's an incompetent scientist that sometimes he makes methodological, obvious amateur mistakes, as we'll find out. He makes boastful conclusions that the data doesn't warrant. And just, okay, am I just attacking this guy? Well, not only has his hypothesis about the shroud been disproven and falsified, the same goes with his Vinland map as well. A bunch of experts ha- have... Uh, and historians, I think it was at Harvard. I'll, I'll look that up, or I'll provide a, I'll provide you guys a source about that. But um, yeah, they've disproven his notions about the Vinland map. That's authentic too. That his findings that the paints didn't couldn't have been uh, date couldn't have been dated to the vi- time of the Vikings is just nonsense. And you know, Macroni's zero for two now. His his reputation has been tarnished in academia. Um, based on these conclusions that he gives. So yeah, how, how does he, what did he do? with the, Basically, Sturp gave him various shroud samples from body image areas, non-body image areas, and uh, blood stain areas, and using what's called PLM, or polarized light mi- microscopy, he made uh, you know several scientific findings and observations, and uh, you know he published these in his, not, pu- not it wasn't a peer-reviewed journal, but he, do- he did publish um, in an academic journal, it just happened to be his own, uh, so of course it got published. Um, but yeah, he, he published his findings, and I'm going to provide a link to his website as well as uh, an article for him uh, based on his findings on the Shroud. Um, there's stuff about the Vinland map there as well. But yeah, he, he basically concluded from his findings that the Shroud images were painted using an iron oxide pigment, a, a red iron oxide pigment in a gelatin binding medium. So that's a, um, a tempera collagen watercolor. That's the type of paint or pigment it was. Um, he also said the blood stains were likewise painted the same, but they later on he had to modify again. Macroni came up with about four theories. He he was wrong three times, and finally he he said, okay, well, there's also red vermilion pigment present in the blood stains, so uh, the blood stains must have been touched up after being painted in iron red iron oxide pigment. They were also touched up with red vermilion or. Uh, Venetian rouge is, is, you know, the the name of the pigment. However, all other scientists involved in Sturp, including skeptical non-Christian ones, ultimately disagreed with Macroni and ruled out this traditional painting hypothesis beyond all reasonable doubt as an image-forming mechanism. Uh, so let's find out why. Why, you know, how does uh, how does it stack up here? So. The first minimal relevant feature is the photographic negativity and the high resolution. How does the painting hypothesis stack up to this? Well, with regard to the photographic negativity or quasi-negativity, you know, Walt Macrone admits that this is a feature, but he says it's only a quasi-negative image. Fine. Remember I said I'm not, uh, we'll assume whatever the best case is for the Shroud skeptics. So in this case, let's, it's a quasi-negative image. Great. Happy to do that for you, Macroni. But um, basically, Macroni himself admits my point. I'm quoting the Shroud skeptic here. Walter Macroni admits that the photographic negativity may be quasi, but that's not that can't be proven. We can't pr- rule out the fact that the hair and beard of the Shroud man are light brown or blonde in color versus actually being white. So he he admits that qualification. This is coming from the Shroud skeptic himself. Like he admits that the data can't go can't prove that the Shroud Man's hair and beard are white. However, with regard to even the quasi-negative aspect, I would say it's questionable. It's it's possible 
but it is questionable as to whether some medieval artist could purposely, and or as Macroni said, accidentally, by sheer chance, uh, paint images using traditional paint techniques to create a quasi-negative image. You know, it has to be noted that prior to the 14th century, prior to the Shroud, there are absolutely none, no other artistically created or painted images that are negative images in the same way the Shroud was. So the Shroud was completely unprecedented in this regard. However, to be fair, it, it has to be admitted that there there have been some subsequent images bearing partial negative images. All of those are historically known to have been copied from the Shroud images or using the Shroud images as uh, direct inspiration. But still, it, it, it shows it's plausible that a medieval, that artists could have, using traditional painting techniques, could have created, you know, semi-photo-negative images or partially semi-photo-negative images. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to assign this a questionable a questionable status uh, for fulfillment of this feature. You know, if you want to be generous, uh, you know, maybe you could give it to the skeptic. But still, I, I think there's an element of questionability, especially as we get into other aspects in conjunction with this. But yeah, so here, here's a quote from Macroni in his book, Judgment Day for the Shroud of Turin. He says, quote unquote, I feel the negative character of the image is a coincidence Revolting, re resulting from the artist's conception of his commission. I feel it is also a coincidence that the negative image yields a three-dimensional figure. Oh, I thought Shroud skeptics like Alan like to deny this, but here Macrony, an expert and skeptic, admits that there's also this 3D feature as well. He goes on, Macrony goes on to say, this is a natural, meaning accidental, a consequence of the artist's effort to produce a body image based on contact points. So, yeah, in, in the first place, I think it has to be admitted that the ultimate shroud skeptic and a qualified scientist, who I'm assuming, you know, layman shroud skeptics don't want to deny his results, right? He admits both the negativity and the 3D aspects of, of the shroud's body images here are actual features. So it's it's undeniable, my friends. It's you're ignorant if you deny these these features. But yeah, what about this notion? Macrony just says it was pure coincidence. It just, it you know, these features just happened to come about. You know, pro shroud advocates question this. Can can you honestly imagine such a talented artist who could have painted the image and would have obtained by an extraordinary chance the wonderfully highly realistic image? That's the high re high resolution. We, a negative photogra photograph plus with three-dimensional images without having in mind even the possibility to imagine such an effect. How could an artist by sheer happenstance stumble upon creating both negative and three-dimensional images using a traditional painting techniques technique when all others uh, have failed to do so, including modern forensic artists as we'll soon learn. Yeah, skeptics, I, I think you're crazy. But okay, um, what about the high resolution and image diffuseness aspect of this feature? Well, here the Shroud skeptic's absolutely right. I mean, the highly resolved nature of the Shroud images is, isn't an issue. I mean, we have tons of paintings that are highly resolved. You can see details between, you know, uh, the Renaissance painters are wonderful. I mean, they, they, this isn't an issue for the Shroud skeptic or the painting hypothesis. Painters can create highly resolved images. You know, just take a walk through your museum and you'll see that. The image diffuseness, on the other hand, is a little bit more iffy. Um, you know, as I said, when you get close up to the image, you can't really see it with, with the naked eye. Uh, it doesn't have any definable borders. So, you know, that kind of makes it hard to... How could a painter paint such an image if he can't see what he's painting? However, the, this objection, this uh, feature can be easily countered, and I, I think Macroni, I agree with him. He, he basically postulates that, yeah, but that's today. I mean, originally, the shroud images were darker and were easier to see at close, aim, close, um, close range, but they faded today. So, you know, he postulates that originally they were at least a shade or two darker red than they are seen today. As to whether that could be said to be historically accurate, um, you know, we know that the shroud images, we have historical proof that the shroud images were faded um, as of at least the 1500s. And if you agree with my link to, you know, in parts two, where I link it to the Byzantine image of God incarnate, you know, those uncircumscribed 
images or the image of Edessa, if, if my argument's there obtained, then we know prior to the 1300s it was already f- faded. But yeah, that you know, none of that really matters. Macroni could just say, well, okay, a sixth century artist painted it, and whenever the images were painted, first century, second century, wh- whatever you want to say, they were originally a shade or two darker, and we will give it to the shroud skeptic. I, I will give them a green check mark on the, the high resolution and the image diffuseness. I think there are postulations where the shroud skeptic could preserve this theory. With the negativity, it's questionable at best. So, what about the uniformity then? Well, uh, in the first place, we have to admit the shroud skeptic can immediately account for the uniform density and the substance uf- uniformity features of the shroud. Painters can create images both front and dark that are and uh, dorsal, which have the same maximal optical densities, more or less. And they also, you know, there are no various substances. It's all paint. It, you know, the hair is painted, the skin is painted. So the painting hypothesis accounts for these, not a problem, right? Like there, there are no substances, differing substances to begin with. It, it's all just one substance and the density can be accounted for. However, here's where the problem comes in for you, Shroud skeptics. The intensity uniformity, the col- remember, the color intensity of each individual fabril is exactly the same. No individual fabril is darker than the other. And that's very improbable. Uh, I would even say impossible uh, to imagine that any artist in any period of history using simple traditional painting techniques with their hand-eye brain coordination in, o- in order to paint with a uniform color intensities on each and every single separate fabril individually. You know, all artistic paintings using these traditional techniques have been shown to have varying color intensities. No exceptions. The, sh- the shroud would be the only one. Impossible, skeptics. Come on, get with it. But yeah, you know, artists, artists, when you paint, they'll apply more pigment to one area over another. Maybe they're pressing a little harder or they put too much paint on, on the paintbrush at one time. It's just impossible. It's physically impossible for an artist using any traditional painting technique to create uniform intensities of image color over the entirety of, of both images. It's just not possible. Sorry, skeptics. Also, just as a note, I, this isn't an MRF, but remember the cylindrical uniformity. It's important to note that the Shroud Skeptics painting hypothesis can't, it's impossible for them to account for this feature as well. If the cylindrical uniformity were ever to be proven, this alone would rule out the painting hypothesis there as well. Okay, so next we have the three-dimensional info, and we've already sort of gotten into that a little bit as well. Macroni, as I said, he admits that the body images do portray three-dimensional or tri-dimensional data. You know, if, if shroud skeptics like Alan want to deny the three-dimensional data altogether, I'm sorry, you're just ignorant. Um, I, I suspect that Alan has some kind of qualification when he denies that, so I'll, I'll see what he says in his detailed critique. But, but yeah, Macrone agrees there are these three-dimensional info on the shroud, but it's a sheer coincidence, as we said. You know, it's an accidental byproduct of the, uh, what he says, quote unquote, the, the artist's effort to produce a body image based on contact points. You know, the, the, darkness, the darkness of most parts of the body image is representing the distance of the cloth from the body at each of these, these uh, various contact points. So, STIRP scientists knew, knew about this and they actually took efforts to scientifically test using various artistic experts you know, certified forensic artists, modern forensic artists, light years ahead of these, um, any medieval artist or something like that, they were commissioned and actually coached by STIRP scientists. Um, this this was done by Dr. Jackson, Jumper, and Erkeline, Bill Erkeline, and they were coached on how to try and actually duplicate the Shroud's 3D body images, all of whom had the benefit of being able to cheat. They could double check and correct their work, whereas the medieval artists couldn't be able to correct or double-check their work with various invisible features and that sort of thing. Uh, They didn't have VP8 image analyzers to check, uh, well, have I got the nose three-dimensionally perfect and stuff like that. Plus, they were even given various anchor points to help them you know, in in relation to certain hard aspects in this regard. So it was kind of like, okay, this will help you create a 3D image and they gave them some anchor points. 
they still failed. None of their attempts using the modern scientific equipment and the most up-to-date scientific know-how, none of them were successful in duplicating the Shroud's 3D features. As the Sturp scientist said, at best, only fair correlations could be achieved by these modern artists using modern methods. And after a series of these extensive scientific experiments, the Sturp scientists were forced to conclude that, quote-unquote, there are extreme technical as well as historical difficulties with the idea that an artist in medieval times or at any other earlier provenance could encode the three-dimensional body information as seen on the shroud into an image artistically crafted in the reverse uh, or photo negativity photo negative. You know, Jackson Jumper and Erkline went on to suggest that the reason for this failure to duplicate the Shroud's three-dimensionality was due to a combination of limited visual discernment of the shading, you know, at a low contrast, and the complete lack of consistent motor, so that's referring to that hand-eye-brain coordination, uh, in applying the correct shading values. Uh, thus, you know, really to think that some medieval artists created the Shroud's quasi-negative and three-dimensional aspects by pure coincidence, uh, based on contact points or something like that, as, you know, as Macrony likes to postulate, you're utterly absurd, skeptic. I mean, come on, grow up and, and try to think critically about things a little bit more. Okay, so next we have the fourth minimal relevant feature. This refers to, you know, things like the vertical vertical mapping of the shroud, the, you know, it's a full length continuous image and that sort of thing. So how does the painting hypothesis stack up here? Well, in the first place, the full length continuous images and the no body sides or tops of the heads being encoded, as well as the alleged non-contact zones, all three of these skeptics, you win. A painting, a painter could account for these aspects or these these features. I mean, we see full-length body images all the time in paintings. Not a problem. Non-contact zones. Well, there there are no such things, right? Because when it's painted, the paintbrush makes contact and paints the images. There there isn't a, a body with a naturally draped cloth over it where where it wouldn't be touching the touching the you know, there wouldn't be these non-contact zones is what I'm trying to say. So good for you, skeptics, you win. The no body sides or tops of the image or tops of the head. Uh, you Sure, an artist could do this and, and we'll give it, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to hold this against the shroud skeptic. I'm going to be generous, but I think you'll have to admit it's a little bit weird. Why, why would a painter not encode these images? Um, it's almost like he's trying to anticipate an impossible knowledge that he wants it to show it's vertically mapped and that you know the sides weren't mapped or, or encoded as body images but yeah this this is where the shroud skeptic utterly fails and this is the vertical alignment or those wrapping distortions um, of the shroud suggesting a a vertically collimated encoding process you know rectilinear or curvilinear you know in exactly the same way that the notion of some medieval artist encoding the shroud's three-dimensional information is utterly inconceivable it's just as incomprehensible to imagine some medieval artist coming up with the concept of painting uh, again with no historical precedence uh, and or even subsequent later copies. There, there are actually no copies of these things either with the 3D or the vertically mapped. You know, an image that would suggest a vertical projection of the body image as it laid in a supine position covered by the cloth. You know, th this notion is just ridiculous on a conceptual level. But, you know, once again, scientific experiments were actually conducted by Sturb scientists to prove this was the case. And they, they proved through their experiments it was virtually impossible for any artist, whether medieval or modern, again, because of that hand-eye-brain motor coordination, to they wouldn't be able to encode the wrapping distortions in such a way as to, you know, in the precise configurations in order to account for this feature, this vertical alignment or vertically mapped wrapping distortion feature. Even the slightest misstep would result in a complete failure to encode this body image aspect, but yet this shroud artist was flawless, incredible. I, I, I'm sorry, skeptics, you're reaching. I mean, just think about it. The, the lack of sufficient motor control of every single human being 
that ever existed automatically rules out some unaided medieval artist coming up with this feature. One thing Jackson uh, Jackson and uh, Erkline and um, Jumper thought of was, what about using a contact modeling, you know, to demonstrate the where the wrapping distortions should be placed in the image? Could this be used to help some medieval artist? But doing that, it was scientifically document demonstrated that the resultant distortions from using a contact modeling would actually be far greater than those observed on the shroud images where the distortions are correlated with a vertical projection of the image. So, yeah, the the notion of a contact modeling doesn't help your case. It hurts you. It makes it worse. Um, so, yeah, uh, again, another chalk up another failure for you shroud skeptics that, that like the painting hypothesis there. Um, what about superficiality, the fifth minimal relevant feature? Well, with... The images being body images being superficial, and there's no um, cementation or cementation of the fibers or, or the threads at all. All painting theories require that a viscous or, or a low viscous painting medium was used, and as such, any and all painting mediums or pigments, uh, you know, or organic stains or dyes, anything in this liquid state would necessarily leave behind evidence of cementation, you know, of the fibers or capillary flow and that sort of thing. Paint would soak down deep past the top two or three. Remember, the thread superficiality would definitely go past the top two or three um, fibers of the thread. You know, it, it wouldn't be just on the primary cell wall at the fiber level. And even at the fabric level, it wouldn't be superficial. It would sink down, soak down deep into the thro into the linen cloth, just as your drink when spilt on a piece of clothing or your rug. Sorry, skeptics, you fail here. It's, it's just ridiculous to think that a painting medium of any type could account for the superficial nature of the images. Not so fast though, Dale. M Macroni knew about the superficial um, superficiality of the Shroud's images. Oh, first of all, interesting, because uh, I know Shroud skeptics like Alan dismiss this feature as garbage. But yet, the ultimate Shroud skeptic and an actual scientist that you like, Macroni, admits this is true. Interesting. Experts versus ignorance, uh, I guess, right? Um, but anyways, the, he provided several reasons to try and account for this. Why, why didn't the images, if they were painted... Why didn't they penetrate to the backside of the cloth? You know, even he admitted that at least some level of penetration would normally be expected from a tempera paint, uh, which, which is what he claimed was proven to be used on the shroud. So here are various justifications that he used. So in the first place, linen is not normally easily wetted by water. You know, it requires many seconds or even minutes for a single drop to soak completely into the cloth surface. Next, as this as the liquid does migrate through the cloth, pigment particles would have been expected to quote unquote settle out, uh, either on or be trapped in the surface markings of the fibers. Next, the coating of the medium on the fibers is extremely thin and nearly colorless. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that later, but yeah, he has a ridiculous ad hoc notion about the nature of the paint. But yeah, um, so anyways, a tempera paint would also be expected to envelop the topmost fibrils and perhaps penetrate a number of additional fibers into the thread. Yeah, but the shroud doesn't, Macroni, so right there you fail, according to your own admission. But um, still, he, he says, but it wouldn't be expected to soak all the way through to the opposite side of the cloth. Yeah, it doesn't matter, man. You, that's, you're trying to account, trying desperately in, uh, to account for the fabric level, but you fail on the thread level. If it goes past the top two to two to three fibrils, you fail. You haven't replicated the shroud. And even Macroni here is admitting this, that hit the painting theory wouldn't be able to account for the thread level superficiality fab, or fiber level superficiality. And he's even iffy on the fabric level as well. But yeah, the chemi chemisorp chemisorption properties of the cellulose making up the linen fibers themselves, he thinks, could have prevented the collagen tempera medium from penetrating very far from the points of application on the surface. Again, these are all fabric level superficiality considerations. He has no knowledge of, and, and this isn't totally Macron. Well, no, it is his fault because he published his book well after Sturp's findings. But yeah, so... What what is it? What do we say in response to these five defenses of how he thinks it's possible the shroud images could be superficial, even if, even if they're painted? 
Well, contrary to Macroni's unconfirmed and unsubstantiated claims, virtually all art historians and scientists, based on the best-known scientific research, have concluded that any and all painting techniques using historically known pigments and or paint mediums up until the year 1355 or 1356, you know, the Shroud's first universally acknowledged uh, appearance in Europe, would all naturally soak down into the cloth and leave behind obvious evidence of cementation or capillary action and flow. And this problem only becomes exacerbated if we postulate an earlier historical provenance for the Shroud. If the Shroud was painted in the 6th century, this problem would get even worse for you Shroud skeptics. Also, even if we hypothetically concede that it's possible to paint superficial images at the fabric level, as, you know, Macroni's justifications seem only to reflect this sort of consideration. As I said, that says nothing about the shroud's superficiality at the thread or fiber levels. These uh, fabrils are too fine to be distinguished with the human eye alone. E each fabril is individually colored, and this would require an, an alleged painter to have access to a microscope centuries before it was even invented. But it gets even worse for you shroud skeptics, because such an artist would need to use a brush with a single br bristle to accomplish the image superficiality at, bo at all three levels. You know, to do otherwise would mean that the paint medium would be expected to soak down past the first two to three fabrils, and certainly beyond the primary cell walls of each fabril. So, you know, envisioning this kind of absurd scenario where an artist is using a single bristle to dipping it in paint and trying to paint out an image, e even if we grant the shroud skeptic this, the painting hypothesis this, this would still not duplicate the shroud's superficiality because even a single sable or horsehair, which is the finest material available in the medieval period, even that is still thicker than an individual fiber or fabril itself, and thus can't account for the shroud's superficiality. Now, what about uh, image non-saturation? Now, here's what I was talking about. I, I alluded to before. Macroni has a very ad hoc and quite frankly ridiculous, historically ridiculous suggestion, but he, he proposed that maybe this painter used exclusively used a very thin co coating of paint. You know, virtually it's almost water instead of paint because it's a very dilute concentration of a gelatin pigment medium, about 0.01% solution. And Macroni said, well, under these this assumption, maybe it's possible to account for the shroud's non-saturation aspect. You know, they're not as fully dark as they could be. But here the question of why any self-respecting medieval artist would go to the trouble of using such a diluted form of painting medium in the first place makes this theory very implausible. I mean, there's, there's no other precedence for this. No other artists in history have ever used such a diluted mixture. So, you know, what, why would a medieval artist use a 0.01% solution? I don't buy it. That's improbable to me. Finally, uh, again, not this is not an MRF, but remember that double superficiality. Once again, the painting hypothesis, if this feature were true, would utterly fail in this regards. It's inconceivable why an artist would, would paint superficial images on the front doubly, but leave the backside not doubly, doubly superficial. It's just too weird, you know, skeptics. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. So, yeah, in conclusion on this feature, if the shroud was ever to be a painting, it, it would, all, it would uh, stand completely alone with respect to image superficiality, and it would be completely unique in the entire history of artistic paintings. You know, if you're desperate enough to try and believe this, okay, um, have at it. But for us rational people, it's just too much to take, I'm afraid, skeptics. So, yeah. Um, what about the next minimal relevant feature, those anatomical and bloodstained features? So, yeah, as I said, with the anatomical aspects, it's utterly impossible, I think, that a painter, medieval painter, could paint invisible serum retraction rings accurately around the blood stains or these halos, you know, that can only be seen under ultraviolet illumination and weren't, weren't known about in the medieval period. It, this is just a clincher. I'm sorry, it's not a paint. These blood stains and serum retraction rings are not painted images. I don't know how to be more emphatic in this. You, it's just, yeah, it's ridiculous to think that that is possible. The painting thing could account for the rigor mortis or the body rigidity, uh, as well as there being no decomposition liquids or, or putrefaction signs evident on the shroud. Of course, 
that makes sense. It was painted. There was never a, a body in there to begin with. However, there is another issue that pertains to the general inconsistency of being able to artistically weave with precision the colored image fibers into, um, you know, into the complex ultrafine relationship observed on the shroud between the image fibers, the blood stains, serum retraction rings, and the scourge wounds over the entire extent of both the frontal and dorsal images. So that's sort of getting into it's. It's impossible that some painter could terminate his blood images precisely at the proper locations where the body images stop, right? Remember, there's no body images under under the bloodstains, and there's no evidence of overlap in one of our additional features. Yeah, I think any painter, even if you're using blood or whatever the substances you're painting, there, there would be evidence of smearing or some smearing or damage uh, and or overlap that would be evident in any and all traditional painting mechanisms. Also, I, I think that many of these wounds are realistic and anatomically accurate. This is un, very unlikely for a medieval artist to paint images contrary to the no, medical knowledge and expertise of his day. I mean, we know how the medical doctors and artists portrayed wounds in the medieval period and before, and how inaccurate and ignorant these these people were. I mean, we have, for example, the 12th century work of Theophilus de Diversis, uh, Erebus. Uh, we also have uh, handbooks from the 14th and 15th century, the work of Sinio de Andre Sanini. You know, they reveal step-by-step -step procedures for how artists of those periods should pre depict various wounds. You know, he has entire chapters of specific instructions on how to paint a dead man, how to paint wounds, and these are the world's experts at this time. And they are terrible. They, they screw up, they mess up everything. Um, but yet, you shroud skeptics think this, you know, this uh, genius of an artist somehow went against all the knowledge of his time and painted these features relatively flawlessly. Now, obviously, um, just as a note, okay, but yeah, but you're missing that counter feature. Remember, the counter features would help. There are some medical or anatomical inaccuracies on the shroud as well. Um, okay, fair enough. I'll, I'll give that to you, shroud skeptics. I think it's a little weird as to how this medieval artist is so brilliant and at the same time so incompetent to encode these inaccuracies, but Yep, I'll give that to you. That that makes sense, and that counter feature supports the painting hypothesis. But yeah, here's a, a quote from an actual art historian, Isabel Pixack, and I'll provide some sources by her as well. Uh, so she says, the initial drawing such, slash painting would have had to include an anatomical and medical knowledge which was barely touched upon even in the high renaissance and a profound biblical scholarship regarding early Christian writings, first century Jewish burial rites, Roman crucifixion methods in the first century Judea, and a premonition about the results of recent archaeological excavations around Jerusalem. The first ever portrait painting in Western culture which is that of Enrico Scrovengi, uh, and uh, he was in Padua at the uh, Arnia Chapelle. So this was in around 1304, and in around the same time as Shroud. The Shroud images was an astronomical distance in quality from the Shroud, from a medical and anatomical perspective. Even though it's not the work of an unknown artist, but that of the great master Giotto. So the development of a portrait painting in its own right had to wait until the coming of artists of the High Renaissance, but even then, a true realism, as shown on the Shroud, was never achieved uh, by painters until the French Academy in around the last half of the 17th century to the second half of the 19th century. This is an art historian and a world's expert, Isabel Pixack, and she says it was impossible no, no painter at that time knew, even the world's experts, you know, knew how to paint these anatomical accuracies or bloodstains so accurately. But yet, the Shroud skeptic wants to say some genius was able to figure it out. Okay, good luck with that. So yeah, as I said, as to the counter features, yep, I'll give it to you. There are, the, there are some anatomical inaccuracies which are true. Um, and this would seem to lend credence to a painting hypothesis. A painting technique could account for inaccuracies uh, on the shroud for sure. Now what about the blood stains though? So the first thing we can say here is that whatever the blood stains are composed of, they have been demonstrated to have 
different mineral composition to the paints and pigments claimed by Walter Macrone. As well, they're completely different to all medieval pigments that were known from, that are historically known about from the medieval period or before. The bloodstains also were shown to have an organic matrix to them. But again, we'll, we'll get into discussion of the composition of the bloodstains in, in the Part 8 podcast. Um, another feature, as I said, there's no body images under the bloodstains. This suggests that the blood was deposited onto the cloth first. Uh, I wouldn't be dogmatic about that, though. It seems the most obvious conclusion that all the scientists and experts mostly go for and mostly think is true. But yeah, how, how this artist could draw such realistic blood flows um, that fool all for modern forensic and anatomical experts, you know, I'm sorry, that, that's just beyond me, um, especially if, if it's true that the blood was deposited onto the shroud first, well, he wouldn't have even had body images to act as reference to help guide him as to the proper position of the blood flows, you know, where they should be placed, uh, the proper size and shape of the of these flows. Yeah, the, these are problematic if, if you give me that the bloodstains were painted first, but also vice versa. If, if the body images were painted first and he just he stops painting the body images precisely in the correct locations for the bloodstains to be inserted later, that's just as problematic as well. Also, remember the serum retraction rings, and that's impossible, I would say, for any human artist, Middle Ages, um, to have had the high hand-eye-brain motor control necessary to consistently terminate these images where the body images are. Furthermore, we also know that the bloodstains were transferred to the cloth in a liquid state, yet there's no evidence of any smearing, uh, damage or otherwise alteration on the blood marks as would be expected if you're using a paintbrush you know there would be at least some overlap or some smearing and damage you know at, at the very least at the microscopic level we would be able to discover this we we discover it in other paintings so yeah this would have been difficult if not impossible for some someone to paint uh, without causing this kind of smearing or damage or something at a microscopic level now there is one possible solution that may be able to help account for some of the unlikely aspects, uh, like the serum retraction rings. And this is if if um, an artist used a, some kind of a combination with a direct contact mechanism of a body, you know, may, maybe this could account for some of the anatomical accuracies as well as the inaccuracies because the, the artist filled in the details or gaps. But this is sort of going outside of the traditional painting hypothesis. It, it, there are There are theories that involve a combination of painting and human corpse. But yeah, we'll, we'll save that for later, but just be aware there are issues with that. Like, how, how would you align, you know, say you put it over a corpse to get the blood stains? Still, you paint, and then you paint the body images around it. How do you, how do you terminate the images? It's still impossible to not have some overlap or some kind of damage or smearing. So even postulating the use of a combination theory with a real body that still doesn't help you account for all the features of the shroud's bloodstains. So, yeah, uh, it doesn't work, even even that. But that's not a part of the painting hypothesis. This is a traditional painting hypothesis by Walter Macrony and others who just say everything was painted. So that's what we're addressing here. We'll address, you know, direct contact or combinations in other podcasts. So, yeah, another thing to note here is that according to actual experts, um, there are no known historical precedents for such details of bloodstains from any artistic work from the medieval period. You know, it seems almost trite at this point to say that the totality of the bloodstains and scourge wounds were thus not simply painted haphazardly onto the cloth with wet blood or paint, but instead they were meticulously crafted. Uh, that's a direct quote from some of these art experts like Isabel Pixack. Also, we know that the blood is not composed of paints or pigments, as we'll soon see in the edition in po part eight of our podcast in our series. So yeah, that that falsifies Macrone's theory right there, if that's true. However, there, we also have an interesting. I'm going to provide a source for you guys, but there's been a series of various scientific experiments uh, to test scientifically whether the blood stains could have been produced, either painting with real blood. But yeah, let, let's say the shroud skeptics said, well, what about painting with actual blood? This could solve the serum retraction rings issue, and, uh, you know, a, whole, a host of others. Like, you know, some of the anatomical accuracies could have been accounted for with the blood stains. So, physicist Dr. Arthur Lind and shroud expert Mark Antianici 
I've actually ri- written a scholarly article uh, detailing some of some scientific tests that they've uh, conducted to test scientifically whether this option, if an artist could paint with actual blood, either human or animal, would would suffice to would it work? And in their initial experiments, Dr. Uh, Lin recognized immediately that there is an obvious problem with this solution: the blood's clotting process. Um, Again, that's where the watery serum is released from my shrinking blood clot, uh, leaving those serum retraction rings. But, yeah, the the problem, it it causes severe difficulties in any artist's ability to paint uh, blood images, you know, with distinct borders, resembling realistic blood flows and all of that. And it's because that the watery serum being squeezed out from the blood clots as they retract actually consequently cause diffusion of the images through the capillary forces, you know, pulling the, the blood along the threads, and they, they often go far away from the tip of the brush and far beyond the boundary of the intended lines of the blood stain, blood images. So you get a blob instead of definable blood stain images like we see on the shroud. So this, this issue of clotting or coagulation of the blood is a major problem that uh, needs to be addressed. One way they, they tried to address this by you know using older blood, and they put the brush uh, deliberately inserted into the center of the clot to exclude the watery serum to see what would happen. Basically, this didn't help out. It just resulted in the blood on the brush being washed off uh, and replaced by the watery serum as it was removed. So... If, if any artist did paint the blood stains on the shroud using actual blood, you know, it became painfully obvious that it, it's scientifically proven that this rapid clotting process is a serious problem that needs to be mitigated against or, or prevented from happening before any artist could use blood to paint these images. Now, there are at least a couple different, I, I, I would actually add a third one, but there's a historically plausible methods that an enterprising medieval artist or quasi-scientist could have employed to prevent the clotting of the blood and and therefore allow him to to use blood to paint these images. So these methods are, number one, stirring the fresh blood vigorously will prevent it from clotting or coagulating for a bit. Or two, you, you could mix in a small amount of lemon juice containing citric acid to the fresh blood. And this would, you know, these are simple methods a medieval artist could do without any deliberate intent even to, you know, so long as they were kept cool to prevent coagulation of the blood and allow them to paint with the blood up to about a few days afterwards before it would would become a problem. However, there is a third option suggested by Shroud skeptic Colin Barry. And I thought this was an interesting suggestion, but he he proposes um, painting the bloodstained images using the blood from inside leeches. Uh, you know, this will prevent the coagulation of the blood when for, for lengthy periods of time. It, it could even last up to months after the initial consumption of the blood by these leeches, and then they can be extracted for painting uh, purposes. So I think that's a rather ingenious idea and deserves method. Like, the, there are many historically plausible ways to prevent the blood from coagulating, thereby eliminating this problem. So... Yeah, I think that has to be admitted. That these are options that are plausible. So what happened when they did this, when they used anticoagulant on the blood? Basically, they found that the resultant images did have definable borders, but they didn't have noticeably darker perimeters like the shroud. This was when they specifically used a small brush. Remember, remember superficiality. It has to be a very small brush, not a larger brush. And even, even then, even if you use a single bristle, it's still too big to account for the image superficiality. But uh, with the blood stains, the blood isn't superficial, so that isn't even an issue anyways. But yeah, so this is what they found. When they used a small brush, the blood stains did have definable borders, so it could have been real, realistic if he somehow had the knowledge of how to do paint these realistic blood stains. Um, but they had noticeably, they didn't have noticeably darker perimeters, and the shroud's blood stains have a milder center with a dark peri- darker perimeter around them. So that's an inconsistency there. So to correct for this, they used a larger brush to see what would happen, and with that, basically, uh, no, they were able to get darker perimeters with lighter centers, but there was no definable borders. It, it, it spread out and created large blobs of blood that weren't in precise 
size, shape, and position of a um, of an actual blood clot as it forms and congeals on human skin, thereby eliminating that. All in all, I, I don't think these types of artistic painting hypotheses can account for the anatomical accuracies or for the blood stains and their various aspects. Uh, just to quote one medical expert, Professor doc, uh, Dr. Pierre Barbet, uh, he says, "Well, the blood sta- the blood stains." as well as the invisible serum retraction rings and scourge mark pictures, were clearly not drawn by the hand of man. They could be nothing but the counter-drawing made by blood, which had been previously congealed on a human body. No artist, not a single one, would have been able to imagine for himself the minute details of those pictures, each one of which portrayed the detail of which we now know about but which in the 14th century was completely unknown. But the fact is that not one of us, even with modern medical knowledge and scientific equipment, would be able to produce such pictures without repeatedly falling into some kind of obvious blunder. So, yeah, you know, as to the three, I concur with the actual experts. It's not, it's not a painted image, I'm sorry to say. Um, but what about those, remember those three bloodstain counter features? There is, number one, the propaint observations. Okay, we're going to delay that for part eight. It's coming. Those need to be addressed. What about the enduring redness? Yeah, well, painting hypothesis could account for enduring redness. If you use red paint, it, it wouldn't turn brown or black like blood would. So it can account for that feature fine. And also those that recent those recent scientific experiments, the, you remember the blood pattern analysis showing that some of the flows are unrealistic? Well, if that's if that was I don't think that's proven true on a balance of probabilities, but if it were, yeah, that would be consistent with a painting hypothesis. You know, I, I would expect a medieval artist to to goof and make unrealistic blood flow, so that makes sense. Okay, f- finally, we're into the final minimal relevant feature. These are the additional features, and I'm not going to go over every single one, but there are certain ones that apply here. So the first one is the fact that there are, remember, the two-dimensional directionlessness, or the, or the fact that there are no evident detectable brush strokes on the shroud. Well, using traditional paints and pigment uh, pigments, uh, and uh, you know, traditional techniques like a paintbrush. Normally, this does leave behind at least a millimeter thick or more paint layer in which two-dimensional directionality of the brush strokes can be observed. You know, did he paint side to side, up and down, uh, uh, diagonally? This is typically what we find. So Walter McCrony, the, the skeptic, he, he admits this is the case with all other medieval paintings. Uh, but he, he postulates very ad hoc solution to this. And he he basically says, yeah, but the paint that they used was essentially pure water. Remember, perhaps 0.01% gelatin or collagen uh, tempera, as well as a 0.01% solution of iron oxide pigment to paint these images. Now, he actually did scientifically substantiate the possibility, at least, of creating shroud images with such a dilute pigment mixture and this he he does deserve credit here he he had an artist friend of his uh named walter sanford actually paint uh drops of the 0.01 percent solution on other linen cloths and consequently macrony was able to scientifically demonstrate that as little as two to three micrograms of iron oxide paint is actually able to give a, a visible discoloration and that uh, you know the variations in the iron oxide concentrations do give an appropriate shading similar to the shrouds. In other words, M- Macrone had um, recreated reasonably similar visible images. Um, so yeah, he, he cr- recreated these shroud images without necessitating the existence of there being detectable brush strokes on the shroud. But a- again, it's highly questionable, very ad hoc. You know, it, it seems historically implausible that a medieval artist would use such a dilute mixture to create his images. Um, there's no reason why he would do this. It just strains credulity. And, you know, th- like I said, there's no other examples of such a dilute solution ever being used on other paintings in that period. So I'm going to be generous to the Shroud skeptic here. I mean, I'm going to assign this a questionable status on this additional feature. Next feature is additional feature number four. The fact that there are no overlaps or no layering, evidence of layering, one layer of paint over another. Basically, I'm quoting the Art Institute of Chicago here, and they say this. So, paintings typically have layered structures consisting of a support, preparation, 
one or more paint layers, and in many instances a coat of varnish. The support may be a fabric stretched around a wooden framework, called a stretcher or strainer, or may consist of panels made of wood or some other material, you know, blah blah blah. Next, the artist may make an initial sketch or underdrawing on the ground, or in some cases, transfer the design from the well-developed preparatory drawings, you know, to use as a guide in his thing. The paint layer, or layers, are composed of pigments suspended in a binding medium, such as drying oil, egg tempera, plant gum, animal glue, etc. And then a final coating with a varnish layer, traditionally done with the old master um, and 19th century paintings, is frequently eliminated in modern and contemporary works. So yeah, the lack of detectable layers on the shroud images makes them rather atypical of other paintings from the medieval period. However, you know, given Macroni's postulated very diluted pigment solution, it may be possible that uh, this feature what could be accounted for. It's a bit weird. Um, I, I think I do think it actually fails with regards to no overlap over the invisible serum retraction rings and, and or blood stains in general for the body images. Okay, I'll, I'll give that a questionable status. I'll help out the skeptic uh, on that front. Next up, um, there's also no uh, detectable dry powder. This is additional feature number five. Dry powder? Why, why is this relevant to a painting hypothesis? They don't postulate dry powder. Well, I just bring this up here because Walter Macrone, as I said, you know, he he's kind of a bumbler as a scientist. He, he likes to make up one hypothesis. He constantly is having to correct himself because he's not thorough the first time around when he's making his uh, scientific conclusions, and this gets him into trouble. I mean, his painting hypothesis went through about four possibly five different renditions before he arrived at the final one, and this is because he's not careful or careful in making his conclusions he's quick to jump and it's a fake i proved it you know like uh and this gets him into trouble unlike the credible stirp scientists who take their time and look at all the different possibilities and yeah so originally walter macrone postulated that the shroud images were quote-unquote finger painted using a dried pigment or powder now macrone later conceded that such a suggestion is scientifically impossible be the case. This is going to be relevant for our next image forming mechanism. I'm going to quote the shroud skeptic Walter McCrony against other skeptics like Joe Nickel and that, that use powder rubbing. But yeah, he, he says this is in large part due to the microscopical differences in the appearance of the shroud's fibers versus a finger painted image. You know, Sturps proof that there are no such dry powders or pigments present on the shroud's images really only further collaborates Macrone's conclusion uh, that a finger painting can't be a suitable explanation for the shroud's image formation. So uh, that's not part of uh, the traditional painting hypothesis as laid out by Macrone in his final hypothesis, but be aware there are finger paintings and Macrone himself thought it could have been one of those and scientifically falsified as impossible. This is a quote from Macrone um, that it's not a finger painting. Okay, so finally... Now we're at uh, additional feature number three, the, the big, this is going to be a show in itself probably. So this is the fact that we know the shroud images are not composed of paint or pigments or any binding mediums. So this is going to be the last feature evaluating this hypothesis in our, our first step of Criterion B. We're going to save that for next time, part eight. Uh, as well as giving our cumulative case considerations and, and um, conclusion on the painting hypothesis in light of those five inference criteria for a more probable explanation for the most probable explanation. Uh, so yeah, uh, see you guys next time and have a great day. Bye bye.